Well, hello. Sorry I'm a little late this afternoon. It took me a little while to figure out how to get the best possible reception. Um, I turned out, turned out to find that using my iPad works the best and gives me the strongest reception. So hopefully this works. We're going through the Gospel of John. Um, if you're joining me, feel free to eat your lunch uh, while you listen. I'm essentially just reading through the Gospel of John and adding a few comments here and there while I, uh, while I can. I've been doing some reading in John, uh, William Barclay's commentaries, so I'll share some insights from that um, and just give you some context. But essentially, the goal of this study is to relax and maybe have some lunch and just hear the Gospel, hear the Gospel of John, read through the Bible, um, get to know the Bible, get to know God. It's it's low key. It's kind of relaxed, and it's really just about listening to the Word of God. And if I feel like I can add something to that, well, I try. Uh, but the main point is to read through the Scriptures together. So just listen in, relax, um, have a cup of coffee. I have mine. It's very full, and um, buckle your seatbelts. Um, John is a fascinating gospel to me. Um, it's becoming, as I'm studying about it more and more, it's becoming my favorite of the four gospels. Speaking of that, um, John um, is written by an eyewitness, and according to the gospel of John, well, you know that as Jesus was crucified, all his disciples abandoned him. They all ran away in fear. And but in the Gospel of John, the author of this Gospel claims to have been there at, at the foot of the cross with Jesus' mother. So in a, in a sense, John is written by an, the only eyewitness who saw the crucifixion, who wrote a Gospel. So this is sort of a privileged point of view we're getting from John, the, the disciple who was even there when all the other disciples had run away at the foot of the cross. It's also the disciple, by the way, who at the, at the Last Supper laid his head on Jesus' chest. So, uh, yeah, there's some touching images here. And just to say that this is, this is a gospel that is written by someone who loved Jesus a lot. We just finished uh, chapter 7. And he's been, Jesus was going to the Feast of Tabernac Tabernacles. In Hebrew, that's uh, Sukkot. The Feast of Tabernacles was a feast where anyone within 15 miles of Jerusalem was required to come to the temple and participate in the festival. They would build tabernacles, they'd build tents, and there were strict rules for how these tents were built. Everyone would, would go and live in these tents or tabernacles. They had to be temporary shelters. They had to protect from the wind but they had to have openings in them. They had to have enough openings so that the sun could shine in during the day and enough openings so that you could see the stars at night. The reason for this is that they were uh, celebrating and remembering the experience of the Hebrew slaves as they traveled in the desert when they had no permanent homes. So it was a way of reminding people where they came from. It's a way of saying, remember that you were once homeless wanderers in the desert and that God delivered you from Egypt. Uh, and so it's, it's a way to keep you humble. It's a way to remind yourself that you were once homeless, so you should have mercy and compassion on those who are wandering and lost and homeless. Um, and also, it was, a, it was a time of light. The, the key was light, that the light of the sun could shine in, the light of the stars could shine in. So light is a key, and Jesus will talk about that. Uh, and... They had a special festival in the temple where they would light four oil lamps that were so large and so bright, it said that they would, you could see them at night from anywhere in Jerusalem. You could look to the temple and see the light shining from the temple. So when Jesus says here, I am the light of the world, he's, this is during Sukkot, this is during the festival of tabernacles where light would shine in through the tents uh, or the shelters and light would be shining from the temple in Jerusalem. So the, the, there were these concrete images that Jesus was connecting to and playing off of here. And, yeah, John, all of John's gospel is built around the six festivals of the temple. 
And one of John's themes is, of course, that Jesus is the temple. Jesus is the place where we meet God and where our sins are forgiven and where we're reconciled to God. So every role that the temple plays, um, a place of God's presence, a place of, of forgiveness and reconciliation, Jesus becomes that for us. And that's one of the points John really wants to get across to us. So we finish chapter 7. Jesus talks about um, uh, the Lord's table here. He talks about being the Christ. He makes a claim to be one with the Father. And now we come to uh, a famous passage where Jesus is confronted by a woman who's been caught in adultery. You all know this passage, but um, I'm sure you don't mind hearing it again. It's a passage about forgiveness. Chapter 8, verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left. With the woman still standing there, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. So what's happening here is that Jesus is teaching uh, near the Mount of Olives. Uh, he, he appeared again in the temple courts. Jesus in John is always near or around the temple. And again, that the reason for that is John wants to show us that, that Jesus is, is replacing the temple or, or rather fulfilling the temple. Jesus is becoming everything that the temple symbolized and pointed to. So he's here at the temple. Now the teachers of the law and Pharisees brought in a woman the Pharisees. Well, the, that's what the Pharisees were. They were the teachers of the law. The law was their bag. The law was their job. The law was their life. The law was how they made their living. Everything they did was built around the law. Um, and they, they used the law to establish and solidify their power and their role in the society. And so yeah, that, that comes into play as we keep reading. Um, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees both disliked Jesus. The Pharisees disliked him because of the way Jesus treated the law. And in a sense, Jesus took away from the Pharisees their ability to use the law as a way to have power over people. And that's why they hated him. The Sadducees, but the Sadducees were priests. And you can imagine, based on what I've just said about the temple, why the Sadducees hated Jesus, because Jesus came to replace the temple. So Jesus uh, radically reinterpreted the law and made it about compassion and love instead of solidifying power. So Jesus took away the source of power for both of these two groups. He took away the Pharisees' power in the, what he did with the law. He took away the Sadducees' power in replacing the temple with his own body. So that's some of the background of what's going on here and why the Pharisees are trying to use the law to trap Jesus. So they bring this woman to him. The first thing everyone notices is that they bring, I mean, it's, so it says that this woman was taken or caught in the act of adultery, which means they caught her in the act. And that's what the Old Testament law says, that if someone's caught in the act, meaning what you just what you think it means, um, this is G-rated, but she was caught in the act. But that raises a key question, doesn't it? 
where was the man? Because obviously he was there. If she was caught in the act, you can't be in the act by yourself. But they brought only the woman. So <laughs> um, there's already a gender bias here and an unfairness that they've only brought the woman. And you'd wonder, you'd, uh, you'd be right to wonder, well, where's the man? And that, it really just shows that the Pharisees were um, really more interested in power than any sense of justice. And legalists, those who beat us over the head with the law, they often are not really interested in justice and more interested in power. Uh, we'll, we'll want to talk more about as we go forward. So then uh, they bring the woman by herself, says the law says we should stone her, which is true. That's what the law says. It's right there in the Old Testament. And then Jesus is writing uh, a finger. At first, he doesn't answer them. He's writing the ground. Now, what's he writing? Some people think, well, maybe he was writing the Ten Commandments. Maybe he was writing the law that forbids adultery. Um, the other guess, and this is the one I like, uh, is that some suggest that he was writing, he was writing the names of the sins of those who were gathered there. As he says, the, you know, who's, whoever's without sin, let him cast the first stone. And in other words, he's shaming the people who brought her there by pointing out the shameful, embarrassing sins that they've committed. And so, yeah, so he's either writing the ten, writing maybe one of the commandments or maybe he's writing the, shin, the sins of those who are gathered to condemn in order to shame them. Shame can be turned around real fast, right? They brought this woman to shame her, and Jesus turns the tables, points the shame back. Uh, he, he writes on the ground, he says, Anyone of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Notice what Jesus is doing here. He's not actually contradicting the law, is he? He's not saying, well, the law didn't say you should stone her. He's not saying, he's not contradicting the law and saying, well, the law is wrong, and you shouldn't stone her. Nowhere does Jesus undermine the law. Nowhere does he say that the law didn't say that or that it was wrong to say it. But what he does is he takes the law and then he intensifies it. In a sense, he's not diminishing the law. He's making the law stronger. He's raising the bar of the law and saying, yeah, it said, sure, it says stoner. That's right. And um, if you want a stoner, then you should be without sin. You, if you want to uphold the law by stoning her, then... You need to uphold the law in every other way. So what he's done is he's intensified the law to such a degree that its verdict is nullified. Another way to put this is that Jesus transforms justice into mercy. Uh, and this is what Jesus does in his whole ministry. He transforms justice into mercy and, and turns it into compassion and forgiveness. So he's... He's nullified the verdict of the law without contradicting the law. It's, it's, it's actually, it's brilliant. Um, we all know the story so well that we take it for granted, but when you look closely at what Jesus does here, it's, it's awe-inspiring how clever uh, and beautiful it is that, that, he's, that he's turned this trick against them so well, so subtly, so elegantly, and it's touching that he, that he can transform justice and legalism into love and mercy. Um, and then they go away, and he says, I don't condemn you. Now go and leave your life of sin. I'll point out one more thing here, which is that um, the Pharisees want to use the law to, to condemn and dismiss. And we are, we are tempted by that. Maybe we know people who are like that, who use religion more to, more to condemn and more to sort of split. Religion helps people uh, decide who's bad and who's good, and religion helps people comfort themselves that they're one of the goodies, and those people out there are baddies. Religion and the law just serves the function of designating good and bad who's to be condemned, and who should feel good about themselves. It's a very selfish use of religion. It's really about power, and um, it's about comforting ourselves and making us better than other people. And that's still true today. Religion can be used as 
a hammer to condemn other people. It can be used as a very selfish psychological crutch to make us feel good by pointing out how bad other people are. And that's the way the Pharisees used the law. They used it as a way to make a black and white dividing line between the good people and the bad people, and of course to place themselves among the good. What Jesus said, what Jesus does is a very different use of religion. There are two uses. There's, there is bad use of religion, and there is good use of religion still today. Religion can be abused just as well as it can be used. In a way, you could say there's, there's good religion and bad religion in the world. Bad religions used to create divisions, to condemn other people, and make ourselves feel better. But good religion is used to both forgive and rehabilitate. That's what Jesus uses the law for here. He uses the law to forgive the woman and to help her change. And so many of the, those who use religion badly are not really interested, it's pretty obvious, in helping They're not interested in helping people become better. They're just interested in condemning them and making themselves feel better. The only valid use of religion and the law is the use Jesus makes here, which is to forgive people and help them become better. That's the way the law should be used the way religion should be used. Okay, there's that passage. Let's keep going. I've shared a lot of my own thoughts, so I'm going to start moving a little faster through the text. Chapter 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Remember the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember the light shining through the tents. Remember the light in the temple that was lit during the Feast of Tabernacles. I am the light of the world, Jesus says. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, journey, traveling through the wilderness, living in tents. The references there are to the Feast of Tabernacles. Will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the light. He is the light coming from those oil lamps. He is the light of the sun and the stars that shine through our tents as we walk through the wilderness. Jesus is the light. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Remember we said last week in Jewish law, you had to have two witnesses for a testimony to be valid in court. Jesus answered, Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you, know, you have no idea where I come from or where I am going. Okay, where, is, where did Jesus come from? He came from heaven. Right? John's gospel begins, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was made flesh. Where is Jesus going? We just covered that on Easter Sunday when we read from the gospel of John. And Jesus says, I am ascending to my God and your God. So Jesus has descended from God and is, ascend, and is going back to ascend to God. Uh, you, verse 15, you judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are right because I am not alone. I'm not, Jesus is not alone. Um, when, he does any, when Jesus does anything, what has he said? He's only doing what he sees his Father in heaven doing. So Jesus never acts alone. Jesus always does exactly what the Father does. I, I'm harping on, I'm repeating myself, but it's so important. Jesus is the reflection of God. If you want to know who God is, Jesus is who God is. What he does is what God does. There is no, um, no disjunction. There is no disconnect. There is no contradiction. Jesus, in who he is and how he is, is the Father. That's who, the Father is compassionate. The Father is loving. The Father is merciful. All right. The... Um, so he, he acts, he's always with his father. He never acts alone. That's, so their objection, your testimony is invalid because there's only one of you. Jesus says, you're, you're wrong. You don't see that I'm never alone, that all I do is what my father is doing. In your own law, verse 17, it is written that the testimony of two men is valid. I am one who testifies for myself. 
my other witnesses is my, my other witness is the father who sent me then they asked him where is your father you do not know me or my father jesus replied if you knew me you would know my father also he spoke these words while teaching in the temple area near the place where the offerings were put yet no one seized him because his time had not yet come again jesus is john places jesus next to or within or around the temple and the the question where is your father of course his father is in heaven where he is where from where he has come and to where he is going and to those who believe in him he will take us with him i've gone to prepare a place for you you've heard that at every funeral okay once more jesus said to him said to them I am going away, and you will look for me, and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. In other words, they don't recognize him for who he is. They, have not, they don't receive him. They don't accept him, so they can't go with him. But to those who do receive him and accept him, we can go with him. This made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. So it's it's conditional upon us accepting him, receiving him, believing that he is from the Father, that he and the Father are one. If we do that, then where he goes, we go. Then he takes us with him. Who are you, they asked. That's the question, isn't it? The key question in the Gospel of John and in our lives. Who is Jesus? Just what I have been claiming all along, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is reliable, and what I have heard from him, I tell the world. Who is Jesus? That's the qu- Barclay is excellent here. Um, he talks about over and over again how Jesus in the Gospel of John puts to people the question of who he is. Who is Jesus to you? Who do you believe him to be? Is he the Son of God, the true and perfect reflection and image of God the Father? Um, Or we've heard before, is he just a man? Is he a good man? Is he a prophet? Is he a deceiver? That's the question that's constantly put before us. But I want to I want to talk about I want to read this little passage from William Barclay. One of the ways well, there's two ways we receive Jesus. One is by faith, and by by reading His Word and believing in Him, making Jesus part of our everyday lives, having Him in our hearts, focusing our minds and thoughts on Him. In other words, we receive Jesus by faith and by acting out our faith. The other key thing is the sacrament of communion. We receive, we accept Jesus and affirm who he is when we sit down and we take the bread and the cup. And so um, here's what Barclay says. When Jesus said we must drink his blood, he meant that we must take his life into the very center and core of our hearts. What does that mean? Think of it this way. Here in a bookcase is a book which a man has never read. It may be the glory and the wonder of the tragedies of Shakespeare. He may have bought that book, but so long as it remains unread upon his bookshelves, it is external to him. It remains outside him. But then one day he takes it down and reads it. He is thrilled and fascinated and moved. The story sticks to him. The great lines remain in his memory. Now, when he wants to, he can take that wonder out from inside himself and remember it and think about it and feed his mind and heart upon it. Once the book was external to him, on his shelf, now it has got inside him and he can feed upon it. It is that way with any great possession and experience in life. It remains external until we take it within ourselves. It is so with Jesus. Here is Jesus, the life of God, the light of the world. So long as he remains a figure in a book, he is external to us. But when he enters into our hearts, he is within us and we can feed upon the life and the strength and the vitality that Christ 
gives to us. When Jesus said we must drink his blood, he is saying, you must take my life inside you. You must stop thinking of me as a figure in a book and a subject for debate. You must take me into you, and you must come into me. And then you will have life, real life. And that's, that's the message of Jesus. Accept him, receive him into your life. Make him a part of who you are, your deepest thoughts. Every day turn to him. Bring him inside yourself. And you do this through faith, and you do this through the communion table. All right, let's keep reading. Let's see if we can finish chapter 8 before we close for the day. Um, here's a key verse, verse 27 of chapter 8. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be, and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. Jesus and the Father, again, are one. Jesus is the image of the Father. But notice when he says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, that's peculiar to the Gospel of John. What's John talking about there? The crucifixion. In John, the crucifixion is referred to as a lifting up. In a sense, for John, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus in this journey that Jesus goes on, descending from the Father and returning back to the Father, the ascension doesn't begin on Easter. The ascension actually begins with the crucifixion. When he's crucified, he's lifted up on the cross, and John sees that as already beginning his upward movement to the Father. All right. Um, even as he spoke, uh, many put their faith in him. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Famous lines. Um, if you hold to my teaching, you are my disciples. And discipleship is the key. This has been a theme for our church. Uh, it's not about just having a title of Christian because you go to church. It's about becoming a disciple and building your life around his teachings. Uh, and then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What's freedom? Freedom is knowledge. Freedom is knowing the truth. Freedom isn't, I've said this a million times, I'll keep saying it because our culture needs to hear it. Freedom is not having choices. Freedom is knowing which choice is right. Freedom and knowledge, not freedom and choices. Freedom and knowledge, that's the link a Christian should make. Um, because it's what's, what sets us free, not choices, but the truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are <clears throat> Abraham's descendants, and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Yeah, um, they're talking about there we're children of Abraham. We're children of the people of Israel who Moses set free. Since we were set free, we've never been slaves, they say. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. As Jesus says, you're quite wrong in thinking that you're free. Your freedom is an illusion. I think there's no more timely or relevant message to our culture. Uh, your choices don't make you free. We think that we're free uh, because we can choose anything we want. Although our freedom's being limited now, we can't go where we want to go, do where we want to do what we want to do. Um, but for the Christian, freedom's not about being able to do whatever you want or go wherever you want or buy whatever you want. Um, so he says, your freedom is an illusion. Your freedom's fake. You don't even know that you're slaves. You think you're free, but it's it's an illusion, your freedom. Um, because anyone who's, anyone, and we are, that's for the Gospel of John, for the Bible, we are slaves to sin and death. We can't escape either one, right? When we, we sin, um, that sin enslaves us, it limits us, it binds us. We're born in the world slaves to both sin and death. We can't escape either one on our own. So he says, no, your, your freedom's an illusion, you really are slaves. To sin and death. Um, and the first step, of course, would be acknowledging that. Then he says, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know 
you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are ready to kill me because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you do what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do the things Abraham did. As it is, you are determined to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the things your own father does. So in other words, he's, th- these are harsh words, but what he's trying to do, Jesus is trying, is to break down their illusions. They think they're free. They're not really free. They think they're children of Abraham, but they don't live the way Abraham lived or do what Abraham did. And so he's being harsh here because he's breaking down their illusions, their illusion of freedom and their illusion about who they are. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, this is sort of a back and forth argument we're reading. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and now I'm here. That, that's, he's hinted at that before. Jesus come from God, and he's going back to God. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. There's uh, two references there to Genesis. Um, The first murderer, of course, is Cain, and the first liar is the serpent. And it's interesting that Jesus associates both those acts, the first lie and the first murder with, with Satan. When he, um, yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. In other words, he, again, shattering their illusions about themselves. They think that they're righteous. They think they have it figured out. They think they're free. Um, but the, before you can accept the truth, you have to lose your illusions. And that this is what he's doing. The Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? <laughs> That's an accusation. One, and they're both false. Jesus is not a Samaritan, and he's not demon-possessed. Verse 49, Jesus answered, I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. I tell you the truth, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Out of this out of this shattering of illusions comes this promise that if you keep his word, you will never see death. At this, the Jews exclaimed, Now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say that if anyone keeps your word, he will never taste death. Okay, again, notice the theme here. I have to point it out. You're a slave to sin, and you're a slave to death. And they're they're not even seeing that death is a prison. Um, Jesus says you'll be set free not only from sin, but you'll be set free not only... Yeah, you'll be set free from death in addition. And the Jews explain everyone dies, even Abraham, even Moses. How could you claim to set us free not just from sin, but also death. Uh, Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Again, the question, who is Jesus? Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim is your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you, but I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet old, the Jews said to him, and you have seen Abraham. So that's what Je- that is what Jesus has claimed. Abraham was looking forward to seeing Jesus and to, and to meeting him. And he saw it, me- meaning Abraham is witnessing this from wherever he is. Abraham saw it and was glad. Um, now, you could, did he see it from the past? Did Abraham see into the future? Or is Abraham witnessing what's happening in the moment? It's unclear. Um, either one would be an acceptable explanation. 
Now they say, you're not even 50, <clears throat> the Jews said to him, and you've seen Abraham? I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, keeping away from the temple grounds. Those are famous lines. Before Abraham was, I am. That is a claim to be divine, a claim to be eternal and everlasting, not just a human, but to be fully God, fully divine, eternal. And that Jesus was not um, born in the first century. Jesus was born of Mary in the first century, but Jesus, the Son of God, has always existed and will always exist because he is divine. That claim that Jesus makes is blasphemy, and at that claim, they try to kill him. Uh, and so that's what you should take home. We're going to close things now, but that Jesus claimed to be God himself, not just to be a messenger of God, not just to be a wise teacher of God, but Jesus claimed to be God, that he revealed the Father and that he and the Father are one. Before Abraham was, I am. Uh, and that's so the priority of Jesus. I've talked about this in the study, but people look at the Old Testament and they see its violence um, and they see they see a God there who is shaped by the culture of ancient Israel, which was an ancient tribal culture. And, but we see in Jesus a revelation of God that trumps the Old Testament. Before Abraham was, I am, Jesus says. So it's Jesus who clearly shows us who God is and his authority and his depiction and his witness of who God is comes before not just in time, but in priority and in authority, comes before Abraham or Moses or anything in the Old Testament. Jesus is God. I'll leave you with that. Um, the priority of Jesus, the authority of Jesus over the, the entire Old Testament, both chronologically um, and in importance. God bless you. Um, I enjoy coming together with you. I miss seeing folks here face to face. It's lonely in this room. But it makes me happy to see that some of you are tuning in. I hope some of you will watch later. Join us Sunday morning. We'll be broadcasting right here from this page. Sunday morning, our worship service at 10 o'clock. I look forward to seeing you then, and God bless.